This time around for the journey for BMG Partners, enabling people to achieve, joined by James Crook, who may not necessarily be a familiar name to people, but what I will say though is Gundowring Fine Foods or Gundowring Ice Cream. Lots of people in our region would know of that for sure. Thanks so much for coming to spend some time in the studio with me, James. Thanks very much for having me. Let's start with your heritage to the area, as we always do, because it's sort of about telling stories of locals, you know, the identities, businesses, things like that. Give us a bit of your background. Well, uh, I grew up on mum and dad's dairy farm here in the Kewa Valley, uh, so Gundaring, trying to not learn about dairy. <laughs> uh, but went to Kewa Valley Primary, uh, Kewa, Valley, Kewa Valley Consolidated, as it was called in those days, in, uh, in Tangam. Yeah, did a couple of years at Wodonga High School and then, yeah, moved away from school from there. And uh, what was your qualification or your career that you were going on to study towards at the time? Uh, I didn't have any idea, and <laughs> I think I still don't really have any idea. <laughs> I came out of school, I think, you know, with a lot of different interests and didn't really know which one to follow. I ended up actually going down the, the route of uh, landscape architecture, which I did a few years off and didn't end up finishing that course, um, but it's it's still something that, yeah, holds a great deal of interest to me now, just uh, as you probably imagine, doesn't have any bearing in ice cream making, so uh, yeah. yeah. Well, so let's go on to the ice cream. Yep. Um, how did that all start? So I'm guessing the family grew up on dairy farm. Yes, yes. I'm aware of the fact that you use your own milk to make the ice cream. Correct, yes. How do you go from dairy farming to the gourmet ice cream maker? That's actually my, my parents' story, I guess. So um, my parents are way back in the day, and it's a bit of a, a short-potted history of the ice cream business, but um, when they were first married, they went to work at a, um, a castle in Scotland. So the history doesn't quite relate how they managed to get that gig, but um, they were uh, the cook and the butler at this at this castle. And uh, the castle uh, was on an estate, and so they were charged to use all the fish and meat and vegetables and stuff that came from the estate. So they got a real uh, affinity with kind of using in-season fresh produce. The people that had the castle also had an estate in the south of France, as you do, and they went with the family down there. Um, the family then said, okay, Sarah and Stephen, we want you to make us some ice cream. Chop, chop, get onto it. So they learned how to make ice cream from a book and bought themselves a little ice cream maker. Uh, that was mid-70s. And, uh, yeah, they, they brought back that love of kind of seasonal fresh produce and, and cooking uh, and ice cream with them from there. From there, they got into dairy farming and did that successfully for many, many years uh, until I think like a lot of people, the millennium was a real kind of uh, occasion to kind of sit back and take stock. And they did that with the millennium you know, approaching and said, you know, what's happening in the dairy industry? Where's our place, you know, regionally and, and within the industry? And they decided that they, that dairy farming had been really good to them. They wanted to stay in the industry, but they kind of felt the dairy farmer's part in the journey finishes at the farm gate. The, the milk tanker comes, picks up the milk, and then whisks it away, and that's the end of your part of it. They really wanted to explore what happens past that. They wanted to do the fun stuff, which is turning the milk into into things. So uh, Dad, having a, a you know a famously sweet tooth, decided that ice cream was going to be the product that they had fun with. So in the early 2000s, they did quite a bit of research. And as a family, we had a few occasions where my brother and I were called back from Melbourne, greeted with a kitchen table full of ice cream tubs and given a spoon, said, all right, taste through all of this. Tell us what you like and what you don't like. So yeah, they got stuck into that. They got really, um, really invigorated by this new project. 2003, they launched Gundaring Finest Ice Cream. And yeah, the rest is history from there, I guess. So, it's going. yeah. And so, those initial flavors, the ones that you had to come home and I'm sure under sufferance taste test, what sort of flavors were amongst them? Are they still the flavors that you uh, work on today or? Some of them, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, because mum and dad had, had done all of that ice cream making and, and they'd been really throughout their dairy farming career, I think most of our birthday cakes along the way were ice cream birthday cakes because they kind of enjoyed doing it. So we'd had a lot of their stuff in the past. Similarly, at Christmas, I mean, we know up this part of the world, Christmas can often be 40 degrees. So your traditional Christmas pudding was reasonably stodgy and heavy. So mum had always done this ice cream Christmas pudding, which was famous in the family. 
uh, she was pretty keen to replicate that, you know, in a business sense as well. So that's something that we're still doing, you know, up to this year. So I guess some of the, yeah, some of those really early flavors were really things like orange and cardamom, uh, quince, persimmon, the, the ice cream, Christmas pudding. So things that were found in the garden and were in season and, that was, I guess, the necessity of it as well. So your role in the family business now, what do you do? Well, my wife and I took the business on from my parents in 2013. So we're now the owners of the business. And uh, my specific role, as you know, in, in small business, you often tend to wear a lot of different hats. Uh, so I sort of sit in the office admin uh, marketing, sales, deliveries, all those sorts of things that are that are not directly related to production. Um, and my wife is pretty much all the other stuff. So she manages the production. And What's the furthest that you'd find perhaps a tub of your ice cream? Do you know where, where the furthest it travels to? Yeah, so we've we've sent ice cream as far as Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of interest from uh, certainly, you know, those parts of the world, Dubai and things like that. So that's... The part as we know it's gone. You watch um, shows like MasterChef and things like that where, you know, people were putting their own spins on traditional things and, and then hopefully one day maybe taking a recipe in some of these different reality shows and then mass producing it and upscaling it. How do you do that um, from, I guess, a, you know, mum and dad's idea to then growing? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And it's it's one of those things where it, it, it doesn't always work um, because there are, there are things that you have to think about, like... Uh, there are flavors that we have done on a really small scale where once we extrapolate it out, it just doesn't work because of cost of ingredients or difficulty in getting them in large enough quantities to kind of do in a commercial sense. Um, and sometimes something that works in the kitchen just doesn't work in, in you know, the commercial sense. So uh, there's been a few that we would have loved to have done that just haven't really kind of made the jump so, and trial and error i guess you're probably an expert in that field yeah a lot of trial and error uh, and again you know our, our team is really good um part of the job description is that we need to taste everything and some of it's good some of it's not so good but um yeah yeah we've a lot of trial and error for anybody who doesn't know you they run into someone that does know you how do you think they describe you i'm a bit of an introvert so i don't know how they'd go but i guess my friends would say i'm probably loyal um Probably someone who uh, gets wrapped up in the emotion of things. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably the best way to describe me. Um, you mentioned, obviously, anyone can relate in small business. You know, you're wearing multiple hats, which also means multiple hours, different times a day that things are on your mind or what have you. When you aren't working, aren't focusing on the business, what do you do with your spare time? Uh, all sorts. I'm a little bit of... I'm someone who enjoys a lot of things but is not good at them, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. So I, following on from the landscape architecture thing um, and having moved back from Melbourne to live at Gundaring, uh, we've taken to renovating a, a little farmhouse and expanding the garden out from a two metre border to, you know, a much bigger border. So spent a lot of time in the garden and thinking about, you know, what the next 12 months in the garden, what we're going to do. Always been a mad keen uh, skier. So funnily enough, i spent more time at the snow when I lived in Melbourne than what I do now when I could <laughs> see the snow from my kitchen window. So cooking is, has always been a big thing for the family. So I really enjoy getting into that. I've got a shed now that I can tinker in, mucking around. Uh, and my son's really into soccer, so I do spend a lot of times in goals being his uh, standing goalkeeper. So that's <laughs> most of the school afternoons. Fantastic. Who do you admire the most and why? They don't have to be someone necessarily personally connected to you it might be someone that you've looked undertake business or the way they conduct themselves in life it's funny I, I tend to probably admire the people closest to me um most i think certainly my parents two of the hardest working people that i know and they have managed to succeed while really sticking with the values that that they hold dear and and not wavering there's been a lot of you know things growing up that I probably didn't realise that um, I admired them for. Things like mum, she was appointed to a board when she was uh, younger and um, the board, I think, had been only men for like 100 years and she was the first woman to be appointed to the board and I think all the, the guys there were a bit 
condescending, a bit patronising to her, but she just sort of, rather than sort of fold like a deck chair, she really rose to the occasion and, and they all respect her for what she did there. So similarly, I think my wife, I held a huge amount of admiration for. She's originally from Austria uh, and moved over here. I think anybody that makes that kind of uh, commitment and, and adjustment, it's a really difficult thing to do when I, you know, have a huge amount of admiration for her every day to have done that. Yeah. Ed, you're right. It's not something everyone can do, is it? <laughs> That's for sure. Are you, are you a philosophical person, James? Do you get into quotes? Do you find a bit of motivation? I do. Yeah, yeah. I, I describe myself as a philosophical what, person. What's the favourites? Have you got the favourite one that comes to mind that you filter your life through? Uh, I've got a couple. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So one thing that was, was really drummed into me from an early age by my mother is a quote that comes from my grandfather. Um, I don't know if it's a quote, but a thought he lived by, which is, an enemy never did anybody any good. And that's something that I'm going to be drumming into my kids as they grow up as well. I think um, diplomacy is something that uh, it's not always an easy thing to do. But yeah, it's, that stood me in good stead. A couple of things, you know, from a, a personal level as well. Um, and I don't know who these are attributed to or anything, yeah. but there's one progress, not perfection, which I think is really good. Probably guilty of being a bit hard on myself as a younger man and I think that's that's a really good one. Um, and another one is do the right thing, especially when no one's watching, I think is a really good one just for self. It's a little bit of an obvious one, that one. A little obvious. Yeah, yeah. Not, not always what people do, though. No, <laughs> that's true. That is very true. What do you consider to be your biggest achievement in life so far? I think, you know, there's a number of things. I think just getting through my 20s was, was hard enough. I had a pretty pretty um tough time in my 20s and uh yeah it was one of those things i didn't realize quite how tough it was until i got to 30 and um had a, a wife and a baby on the way and i went she said decade was was really tough i didn't enjoy that very much at all yeah so i think yeah getting through that was was a, a big achievement do you want yeah. to talk some more about that or in terms of what? uh yeah i, I just think uh, you know in my 20s i probably uh, didn't do as well as I would have liked to have done in things like university and, and personal stuff. And yeah, I think, you know, it was, it was a tough decade. And I think a lot of people that I speak to, uh, have the same, you know, issues and, uh, yeah, again, as I said, probably a bit hard on myself and certainly, you know, with the benefit of, uh, now being a parent, you kind of look back on these things and, and think, wow, that was a bit bit drastic um, <laughs> <laughs> how irrational was i <laughs> yeah a little bit a little bit so um yeah with the benefit of um perspective yeah it was, it was tough we've all heard about sliding door moments you know fork in the road in life have you got any sort of things that you've looked back at from time to time and yeah yeah there's there's a few so when i finished my high school uh i got offered an opportunity to go to austria with some friends of my parents who were doing a, a ski instructor's course. And the idea is that you go uh, across there and you spend a month traveling around and they basically teach you how to be a ski instructor in Austria. And got the opportunity and I said, yep, absolutely. So I went and did that. Really from that, I met my now wife and my love of skiing kind of was cemented in, in that month. And I've been back and forth to Austria now because I've got family there now, but many, many times. Yeah, that, that really kind of has coloured my life in so many ways that are, are really enjoyable. Similarly, I think uh, the opportunity to move back to Gundaring and take a proper role in the business was one that at the time I sort of took flippantly, but it, it's been, yeah, it's been a, the, one of the best things I've ever done. Tough decisions. What do you like with them? Do you make them rapidly? No, I'm not great at them. <laughs> <laughs> I envy the people that do those things quickly and easily. The decision, yeah, as I just said, the decision to move back from from Melbourne to, to Gundaring to, you know, take a, a greater role in the business. Um, I grew up on the dairy farm and I, probably some other people that have grown up on farms can appreciate that um, it's not always the most hip happening place when you're a kid and yeah. couldn't wait to get away. And so moving back home, after having lived, you know, abroad and, and, and in Melbourne for many years, it was a bit of a daunting prospect, but it's uh, it's been the best 
one of the best things I've ever done. And so it sounds like where you've landed yourself now, you know, now running the business and, and, and having ownership of it, that's not what you'd planned to be. No. <laughs> so no what was what was just you know, you spoke about sort of having different interests and not really sure what to do. What was the, the internal child or what was the aspiration when you're on the farm, you're wanting to get out of there, you're wanting to get out and see the world and see what's on offer? What what were you hoping to do? Yeah, good question. Probably uh, be a footy player or a <laughs> or a professional skier or um I well, actually um, got to sort of live my dream fairly early on, which was to be a ski instructor. So I did a couple of seasons in Austria and and at False Creek. Uh, but, uh, yeah, look, certainly living back on the farm and, and running a business was n- nowhere near on the, on the agenda or the horizon. So uh, it's, yeah, a bit of a surprise to, to find myself where I am now. Yeah. And no regrets, though. Definitely none, no. <laughs> so the benefit of hindsight, you know, you, you sort of mentioned your... You know, your sort of filters, there are a couple of bits of advice that you sort of appreciate and recognise now. With the hindsight, if you're talking to a younger you or someone who, even like you sort of said, was in their 20s now, I'm thinking, geez, this guy's right. You know, the 20s have I done the best I could, you know. But what's some advice that you'd give yourself sort of throughout those younger years or earlier years? Just not to be so hard on yourself, I think. Um, I think it's very easy to do. And, and I think, you know, there's plenty of people throughout life that all do that job for you. You don't need to make it easy for them or join in with them. Yeah. <laughs> so true. Oldie but a goodie. If you were in, able to invite three people to a dinner party, um, alive or dead, to be there with you, maybe you'd be offering them some ice cream at some point, <laughs> who would you have sitting there with you? This this might be a bit of a, a cop-out question, but probably i got a couple of friends that I've got from school days that uh, we had a really – tight-knit group of, of mates you know that has we've all drifted off into different parts of the world and and doing our own thing but i think probably my ideal dinner would be to have a couple of those guys around again that'd be the absolute most fun for me yeah. and then trying to piece together what's happened in between i guess would be quite entertaining yeah i think it's it's one of those things we do keep in contact but we don't get to see each other very much so getting everyone sort of back in the same room would be an absolute riot i think mm. Mm. Sweet or savoury? I have trouble asking the ice cream man this, but uh, what is your preference? Well, part of the job description, as I said, is that you've got to eat ice cream. Uh, so I end up eating my fair share. Uh, so I tend to go for the savoury things. Those are the things that I really uh, I really enjoy um, because the sweet side of things is just a, it's a prerequisite, really. Yeah, and I really do enjoy sort of cooking and playing around with food and and experimenting with different things it's just something that as a family we've always really enjoyed afterlife who would you come back as Ooh, big question i think that the animals on our farm have it pretty good so when i was growing up mum and dad really um put a lot of effort into replanting the farm um a lot of effort into the environmental side of things to try and get some biodiversity back into uh back into the farm and it's been really successful. So we've got heaps of birds and animals and all sorts coming to live, which is which is great. They have it pretty good. Um, similarly, the cows have it pretty good. But I think probably the dogs have it the best. So I'd come back as a dog on our farm. <laughs> uh, what breed? Uh, they're all bitses, so. <laughs> yeah, just whatever. <laughs> yeah, However you come. <laughs> whatever, yeah. <laughs> What are your plans for the weekend? You're not going to be skiing, obviously, this time. No, here, well, you, you could be forgiven for, oh, well, for trying, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I think probably do a, a couple of hours of delivery each drive around the region, yeah. which I really enjoy doing because you get to get out and see what's happening and talk to other people, other business owners. I'll be in the garden getting some more gardening done uh, and, um, yeah, probably getting ready for Christmas, getting ready. We've got a up due in January, so oh, getting ready. Yeah, thank you. Um, getting ready for that, so yeah. Oh, great. So we've spoken about flavours that you've had in the past. Um, I'm sure there's different inspirations and different times, but you've probably got your core product that everybody is familiar with or knows and loves. How do you progress? How do you advance and change what you're doing but still keep what you're doing the same? Yeah, good question. So I guess the inspiration for flavours comes from many, many different places, um, whether it be from things that people suggest to us or a lot of times it's chefs that come to us and say, hey, we've got this crazy thing we want you to try out. Why don't you have a crack at it? Some of our most popular flavours have come about that way. So uh, one of the flavours that we're 
probably most known for is the licorice, which was put to us by one of the local chefs. Uh, and it's just technically it's a fantastic product. And I think if we ever took that off the list, there'd be um, rioters outside the front door. So, <laughs> so that's one way um, or a couple of ways. Going about developing different products and trying to keep it the same, we have a, a very clear view of what it is that we want to do in terms of flavour profile. And so in some ways that actually weeds out the things that we can't do. So we don't use uh, artificial colours and flavours. So it's got to be real fruit. It's got to be real nuts. It's got to be locally sourced. So if some of those criteria, you know, make it not possible, then that's an easy one to just go, okay, can't do it. So yeah, we've done over 350 odd flavours in the last 16 years. Um, so we've done our fair share. Not all of them are going to make it into a tub and sit on a shelf. Some of them are going to stay as a one-off. Green olive in anchovy comes to mind. It's a one-off. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it is a bit of a challenge actually to to add new things in because that means in some ways you've got to take some older stuff away. And people tend to get really attached to certain flavours. And if you, for whatever reason, stop making that, the phone rings and people aren't happy. And similarly, when, when we go to events and things, if we forget to bring if licorice or cafe latte or something like that, people let us know about it. It's a tricky and, one. and at what point do you do you commit to that flavour? Is it is it based on interest or lack thereof? Or how do you how do you make that sort of upscale and and I guess circulate a flavour? It's got to get to a point where we're really happy with it. Um, and that we're when we're really happy with it, then we take it to the market and sometimes other people are and sometimes they're not sometimes it's a bit of a hit and hope exercise um and sometimes it's we know it's going to work because it's been requested anybody in small business knows that you know we've spoken a couple of times about it, wearing the multiple hats and and particularly with yours which is a sort of i guess a home-based farm to being manufactured and then you know circulated how do you get the balance right between family business discussions and, um, and I guess staying sane. <laughs> the balance, poorly, I think. Uh, I think most people in the small business would struggle with that. I think it's, it's pretty universal. Yeah, well, I think we're quite unique in that we live on the farm. Our house is 40 metres from where we work uh, and my parents live another 300 metres from there. So there is certainly times when there's perhaps too many cooks in the kitchen. Um I guess communication is, is really the key to that. We all try and probably over-communicate at times, but just really respect what each other is, is doing and and what we need and feel free to kind of voice that if it needs to be. But, yeah, and in terms of, uh, I guess, working within a family unit like ours, it's got some positives, it's got some negatives. Um, we try and work as best with those as we can. Uh, and especially with working, you know, so closely with my wife and, and sometimes it can be difficult to go from the ice cream factory back home and switch off your brain. And my wife's better than me. She usually pretty good at saying, stop talking about that. We're, we're home now. We're going to do other things. But uh, one of the things, uh, and going back to an early question that I've always really admired about um, my parents is that they both have very different skill sets. And what they've been so good at doing is kind of joining those together and, and really getting the best out of their their strengths and their weaknesses. So hopefully, in a lot of ways, very similar. We've got very different kind of approaches. So hopefully, yeah, we're making the best use of those. <laughs> All right. We've been speaking with James Crook for the journey, thanks to BMG Partners, enabling people to achieve. And James, uh, behind Gundowring Fine Foods, but best known for your ice cream, you see it on menus all throughout our fine dining sort of uh, restaurants, Strat, Albury, Rudonga, Rutherglen, but as you said, internationally as well. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for having me. Mm -hmm.